21st century superhuman And I know that the answers are inside Yeah, I am the 21st century superhuman Now, now, now is the time Come, come Come on, everyone, let's celebrate. We are the children of the sun. I can see you when I look into your eyes. We are the same, and we are light, and we are one. And we can make a difference. Hi there, I'm Carrie Ellis, author of 21st Century Superhuman. This is our 21st Century Superhuman show, and today I have with me the illustrious Peter Moon, who is a great author um, through a company called Skybooks. That's how you find him, Skybooks USA. Yep. So Peter has been a, you've been a great assimilator of the time travel knowledge and you've known different pretty impressive people who've worked with different time t- travel programs. So we're gonna visit about that a little bit today, maybe how we can change timelines, what kind of ideas and input you have for us in this modern world related to time travel. You also have the Time Travel Education Center, which I love going into and being part of. Um, You have a lot of knowledge stored there. So, Peter, how are you doing these days? It's been a while. Very good, very good, thanks. Give us your, your download, your update on how you feel like understanding different timelines, understanding different possibilities, can help us in this wild, crazy ride we're on on planet Earth? All, every, I mean, it's it's really a matter of understanding the universe. And if you look at, you go back into history when people had the idea that the Earth was flat. Right. And then they learn more. uh, You know, at at the same time, there was ancient knowledge and wisdom that was lost. And there's new wisdom that is gained. Right. And right now we're at a time period where people have a much higher regard for ancient wisdom than they did say a hundred years ago or yes. 50 years ago. And, and, and so we also have modern knowledge and, and there, you know, there, there are a lot of negative aspects that, that people grapple with. But when we talk about time lines or time travel, it's a matter of understanding the universe and where we are in relation to it. it. It doesn't need any correction. It doesn't need anything. It just is. And it's, it's a matter of our consciousness is what is uh, an experience. It's an experience. So, and of course, it in, as time is a fundamental eroder of consciousness or seeming seemingly eroding of consciousness Mm -hmm. uh, that is a you know that is what facilitates death if you look at it from that perspective and and this is interesting because in astrology uh saturn is identified as the the planet saturn or the archetype of saturn chronos which is time is is identified as the grim reaper Mm -hmm. and and it is the capricorn is the sign of time Hmm. Uh, for that reason ruled by saturn chronos so so this is you know it's like you could say you're studying the process by which people erode or by which bodies erode Hmm. like to say and lightness on what the universe is as you're defining it here because that's a a big concept and i think the most remarkable thing i've discovered in, in all of this um you know, Dr. David Anderson's work, some of his earlier work discussed black holes. Uh-huh. And it's all scientifically accurate based upon the, what would you call it, the horizon of knowledge. But the book I, pu- I published, um, not this year, uh, the previous year, Inside the Earth, by Radu Sinemar, goes into a deep discussion of the black hole phenomena and what black holes truly are and how all of our universe stems from black holes. And there's a creation process that goes in. And then as things become, and then all of this is attuned to different vibrational frequencies. So vibrational frequency is a word that I've 
uh, has come into my vocabulary as a result of editing these books. The mm. first one, Inside the Earth, and the, the one that was released this year, Forgotten Genesis. I uh, like which, that. Yeah, which goes into the history of mankind and the mm -hmm. DNA of the history of mankind. So it's, it's and, and of course, vibrational frequency has to do with the fact that it's like if you were in a, uh, like say right now, we're in, uh, we're in space. Right. And all of these, what we know as EMF, electromagnetic, or maybe more identifiable to the public as radio frequencies. There's all these different frequencies bouncing all over the earth. And when you take a crystal receiver and tune in to the frequency, you get a radio station. And these frequencies carry what's called intelligent information. Sometimes the intelligent information is audio. Sometimes it's visual. Uh -huh. There's no reason that it can't be sensual or, or tasteful. Mm -hmm. There's no reason it can't. But we tend to emphasize the audio and the visual. So th this is, um, and, and of course, what radio station are you tuned into? Mm. And I'm saying I like that, yeah. Yes, what you tune into. Now, one of the things in today's world is it's very important to either tune off, tune out, or tune down, you know, the major media. Yes. And people resonate with that. And mm -hmm. those people who have the platform have a tremendous amount of influence to those people who listen to that frequency. Right. And it reminds me of that, uh, the character we know as Timothy Leary, what did he said, uh, you know, tune in, turn on and drop out. Yes. He was, talking, he was talking about tuning into a frequency. Yes. And he was, he was, you know, for whatever misgivings he had, and there were many, he was talking about tuning out of society. Yes. And, and, uh, or society at large, we should say. Well, yeah, or, or, or the, the programmed system that is the, putting the out programmed a system frequency. Of, of society. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and you can equate that mythologically or otherwise to the beast, mm, you know, see, they refer yes. to the beast uh, in the Bible or wherever. So, yes, you, you want to tune in. And, you know, he's talking about turning on. He's talking about using consciousness, altering substances. On a, on a higher plane, we could talk about alchemical elixirs. Yes. And this, this is a key. Now, I, I've talked about Redu Cinemar's books, just mentioned them rather, Inside the Earth and Forgotten Genesis, uh, two very different books. Mm -hmm. All of his books, one of the most, I would say, noteworthy, if not complementary aspects about his, his books are that they are very different. Uh -huh. They have similar characters, similar themes, but they're, they're, each book is very different from the other. Right. Other. That's kind of an odd name, Radu Cinnabar. Can you tell us just a little bit about him, where he comes from? It's, it's a pen name. And it's a pen name. Uh -huh. And he comes from Romania. Right. And I And you've had great adventures in Romania, in the tunnels in yes, Romania yeah, yeah. in the independent of him, but but complementary right. uh, to some extent of, of, of what he does, uh, or or maybe a large extent. But he is uh, I believe him to be a musician mm -hmm. uh, who was selected to view a discovery in uh, beneath the Romanian Sphinx of a chamber that, that took years to unearth. Right. By the Romanians and the Americans together working in concert, which uh, formed an alliance between the two governments with Romania becoming a part of NATO. And Redu Cinemar was uh, picked to, to view this underground chamber with holographic technology because they wanted to view it so he could write about it. And he didn't he have kind of slightly supernatural abilities that were gifted to him somehow? No. No. Uh, no I mean, maybe inherently like we all do, but no, they were right. cultivated. Okay. Obviously, sub, uh, 
the, the one who did have was born with uh, super, what you might call superhuman abilities was, was Caesar Brad. Right. Who, who, who was uh, the head of, who, who evolved into becoming the head of Department Zero. I'm getting Rom chills as you talk about it. Okay, Romania's intelligence, the secret, most secretive intelligence division, he handpicked Redu. Mm -hmm. How he picked him and why he picked him, uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But he yeah. picked him and he said, you know, this guy, he, first he just comes off as a journalist who's there to do a job and write a story. He doesn't exhibit anything special mm -hmm. uh, other than, he's allowed to experience this, which is special in itself. In the second book. Um, so which book tells about the chamber? The first book. The first uh, book. The, the, the Transylvania. And, it, and that's fascinating. Okay. What's the name of it? Transylvanian, Transylvanian Sunrise. And do you want to describe the chamber a little bit? And then you were going to go on to the second book. Well, yes, that book is, uh, discusses a holographic chamber beneath the Romanian Sphinx. It's about 300 meters beneath the earth. And inside there is a uh, tables with portions where you put your hand over it and will read out your DNA. The closer right. you put your hand to the table, the more microscopic is the DNA down to the at least the atomic level and perhaps at the quantum level. Uh, when you go to other tables, you put your hand over, you'll see a readout of of DNA from a, a life form, and it'll also, in holographic, and then it'll show a holographic readout of, of the star system it's from and the planet it's from. And if you put the, over another Amazing. one, simultaneously you'll get a hybridization of what the animal would be. So and this did, is, did you get from his writing any feeling of who left that here? Does anybody even know? It was a very touchy subject for him mm -hmm. in the beginning. He sent me a whole CD. Uh, uh, talking about it. Wow. You cannot discuss who or what put this here. Well, it's, it's obviously uh, been put there from uh, creatures from another realm. Mm -hmm. uh, whether we want it, because, you know, he, he will talk about extraterrestrial DNA as he gets into the books and the, and the theme of extraterrestrials. But there's also interterrestrials that yes. are inside the earth. So yes. you're really dealing with consciousness. Yes. And what, what was there was put there by a consciousness. Um, yes. It's kind of like if you, well, I, I will tell you this as a writer, one of the neatest experiences as a writer, and I don't really get a chance to enjoy it too much, is when you go back and read what you wrote mm -hmm. and right. a long time ago, and it's yeah. out of your mind. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a little bit like going back and studying the lessons you did in the third grade, the fourth grade the sixth grade or the paper you wrote to, wow, I remember writing that, but life is so different now. Right. So you go back, uh, particularly the novel I wrote, Spandau Mystery. I mean, I go back and read that. I go, wow. Okay. Wow. This is, you know, I, I forget all the events. I could read it as if somebody else wrote it. Uh -huh. uh, although I do generally, I don't remember all the details. Right. And, and it's fun. So yeah. what I'm saying is somebody at some time in history built this chamber. Right. And it's like, you know, could have been yourself. You could have been one of the builders for all we know, you know, because it's, it's like life is a continual process of, of discovery and rediscovery. Yes. And, and, and the themes repeat. Mm -hmm. This is the themes that repeat. And this is why, like, say, particularly in 1950s Hollywood, they would have a script for a story. And they'd say, okay, and, and, and they were cheap. You know, uh, the production companies were often cheap. More often than not, they were trying to make a buck. So they'd say, okay, take this story, uh, make a Western out of it. Good, now make a jungle story out of it. Change ah. the You know, and instead of a butte, uh, you've got a, a waterfall in the jungle. Or, right. You know, and then you, you change the characters. Instead of a, you know, an Indian witch doctor, you have a African witch doctor. And all of this stuff, and then they would right. change scripts, and now, okay, let's make it a horror movie, all right? Let's uh, make it a Victorian period, uh, you know, a movie, or they do it with movies, and they do it with TV shows. So life is, and, and you know what? You, as a, as a viewer, you might not notice it. Right. Because you're so wrapped up in the story. imagery yeah. and the story. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's, it's going to have nuances and differences. So um, after a while, you might notice it's the same. And, and so this, this is life is, this is what life is. It's right. So then you were going to go on to book two. And I also wondered if there's any themes of time travel in these, in the Radu Cinnabar. Yes. In the first book, uh, there is a strong theme of time travel because they have a, in the projection hall inside this chamber is a device where you can view the history of the world, but you don't travel in time uh, bodily. You right. view it. Um, and in the third book, Mystery of Egypt, they go to a similar installation beneath the Giza Plateau where there is, you can mentally time travel. Right. Do you, think, do you think anybody does physically time travel or do you think it all is an inner experience? It's physically possible to time travel and my answer would say definitely yes. They have time traveled to the best of my knowledge. Mm -hmm. I haven't, why, why, I've seen one person time travel, uh, but it, it's, it, it leaves a lot of en en enigma and questions. But no, the work of Dr. David Anderson, yes, people have been sent back into time. How far they've been sent back and how often, I can't answer you because I don't know. But the technology is definitely there. Interesting. I, I would also point out that I recently uh, was up very late and I saw on um, a t old Twilight Zone episode of, about time travel. Right. Where mm. uh, Buster Keaton, the famous uh, actor from the silent movie days, had a, uh, he comes forward into time and he has this corny looking helmet. I mean, it's a, a real corny looking thing, but it's a great prop. And uh, he's, he's getting it fixed. And when it's fixed, this scientist, you know, steals it. And they end up both going back in time. And the scientist, who's kind of boorish, uh, overweight and boorish, he gets back into 1890s where he thinks he's gonna, you know, have all these resources and genius and he'll be the smartest one around. And he's lost. He's like a fish mm. out of water. And he, he, you know, can't get anything he needs. And he ends up going back into the future. And the moral of the story, Rod Serling comes out and says, you know, you're better off to stay in your own backyard. Yeah. And this is an important theme with mm -hmm. people who want to be elsewhere and go elsewhere. Um, you, you have to pay attention to where you are and, and master uh, or at least representatively master your current environment before mm -hmm. your, um, you, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a ball player wanting to go to the big leagues when he hasn't even mastered the, you know, the lowest level of minor league. And, right. and this is one of the problems, uh, you know, and, and then they, they get on the uh, lecture circuit, you know, talking about it, but they, they can't throw a ball. Mm -hmm. well, like, so, so, and this is, this is the problem with many people who iterate on this subject right? Uh, they, you know, from the viewpoint of experiencer, from the viewpoint of experiencer. Um, it's like, what is the integration of this experience? Um, all of this stuff came to me by reason of being integrated, not by jumping out on limbs, not trying or wanting to be a time traveler. That's not something I've aspired to. Right. Uh, seldom think about, if ever. Um, you know, so it's, um, but it's a part of life. Time is a part of life. So it's a self-discovery process. Right. But you want to discover it and, and see what it does and, and where it goes. And, and this is a very important part. Um, I've thought of a theme. I, I might put it into my next newsletter. I do a quarterly newsletter, the Montauk Pulse. Uh, you can sign up for it at skybooksusa.com. But very interesting. Yes, the theme is alchemy versus insanity. Mm. And I, I was watching some videos on alchemy, and they don't really say anything or they don't know anything. But um, in the new book that I'm translating, uh, it's called The Etheric Crystal by Radu Cinema. This is very new. interesting. I've been getting to read it as it comes along, being a member of your time travel. Education. Right, and, and so I finished eight chapters out of ten, and, and the ninth chapter is equally interesting to the first uh, eight, mm -hmm. and it's basically, you know, the, the, the purpose of alchemy is to 
find the Philosopher's Stone, uh, which is really nothing more. Well, it's, I shouldn't say nothing more because it's quite a bit, but it's to integrate yourself completely and utterly with the mm. universe itself. It's like becoming one with the universe or being able to, you know, flow in and flow out and have a complete harmony. Beautiful. Now that's, very, that's a very uh, evolved state. Yes. And even, it, it, and even the character who appears in the book, Eleanor, uh, he is a, he has achieved tremendous amounts of accomplishment in this art, but he would be the first to tell you that he still has a long way to go. Mm. You know? It's like, you know, mastering something. No, no, no. But, I mean, he would look like a master to us with what mm -hmm. he could perform. But it's, it's like something you continually um, work at. But the point of it is, is the main point of alchemy is to transmute base metals into gold. And one of the more disappointing things I have experienced as a writer is to watch people... Uh, consume the information that I have published and resonate with it to the lowest common denominator. Mm. Yeah, I see that once in a while too. And, I see um, a lot. Another point with this is that I think it's very much a personal experience. And I think sharing experiences in a group forum is not necessarily the best way to go about it. I mean, there, it's going to have some value, but you're, and some people need to experience things in a group for, what, for whatever reason. But it's something, the real work you're going to do is internal and by yourself. You, right. you, your own self-revelation. So um, people often think, like what they like to think of as the end times is, is a group endeavor. Uh -huh. And it, it, it's not to say that it can't be. Like if, if, a, if, a, if a planet or a society goes through a, a horrible experience like a hurricane or a war or 9-11, there is a group experience. Action, right. experience. But, but internally, like, you know, people are meeting their maker every day. Yes. Every day. So a personal choice, how we relate to those Being things. Being born into this world every day. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're going to have your own, be more concerned about your own personal apocalypse. Yes, your own personal, very nice. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and because that is more worthwhile and, and evaluate your own situation. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's valuable sometimes to, to see others and compare to others. Because um, like right now we're in the middle of this uh, coronavirus fiasco right and some people are really doing poorly and you yes. don't hear about them mm -hmm. uh, they don't have income right uh, they don't have much of a life and there are other people who are doing well and relatively thriving so to speak. yes so it's 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 like you know uh, the screws are being put mm -hmm. to, uh, you know to 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 all of us but yes more so into particular pick particular people and all of this is right. if you can escape into another timeline. Well, the way you escape into a timeline is you find something productive to do. Yes. Well, I, clean I, house, yes. Whatever it is you need to do. You're kind of right. setting a new narrative in motion. You're setting a, a choice, a narrative by choice um, so that you can have exactly. fulfillment in that unfolding process. Precisely. So um, I know Preston Nichols passed. Can you, toss out a little bit on what his experience was with maybe a summary of, I know he had to do with Montauk, um, with time travel. Can you give us a little insight Preston into that? Nichols passed away in October of uh, 2018. His um, colleague and, and friend Duncan Cameron passed away in June of the following okay. year, in 2019, right. almost a year ago. And uh, Preston was a genius ever since he was a young young kid he was wow. a genius with electronics mm -hmm. and he had experiences which he identified with being taken to the pleiades uh -huh. and he wrote a book about it called uh encountering the pleiades a, a, an inside look at ufos is that in in skybooks yes skybooks yes skybooksusa.com and, and uh regular 
book form. And, and of course, that was his story about being taken to the Pleiades where he was given a accelerated education in electronics. Wow. And this set the stage for him to deal with phenomena that involved time. Now, mm -hmm. his father, who, who his father identified himself as the Doubting Thomas of, of all this stuff about time travel and the Montauk Project, uh, said to me that there's no doubt about it. When Preston was a certain age, he had a, a capacity and knowledge for electronics that was just accelerated overnight. He didn't wow. know where it came. So he was already a genius, but now he was like a super genius. Mm -hmm. So, so he, his knowledge of electronics, and uh, we're talking about frequencies, EMF, electrono, electromagnetic frequencies, are all about, is all about frequency. So mm -hmm. he was an expert on frequencies. He could talk ad infinitum about the different mood, moods that could change and all the technology that could change. And he was privy, I think one of the things that really sealed his fate in a way, in, in an interesting way, was when he was assigned working, and I, I couldn't put this in the original book. I did put it in the updated version of the Montauk Project, interesting. Silver a Silver Anniversary Edition. Did you have to uh, wait until uh, after he passed to add it to the book? or No, I, I didn't wait. Uh -huh. I told him I was going to put it in the updated version, and he was he had less than a year at this point, I think. And he said, mm -hmm. I don't think that's a good idea. I said, I said, Preston, nobody cares anymore. Nobody cares. And he goes, okay. In other words, in other words, he was still in paranoid bill. And, right. and you'll, when you hear what I have to say, you'll, you'll see this because he was subjected to so much secrecy. Uh, he, he worked for airborne instruments laboratory, uh, a defense contractor on long Island. Mm -hmm. And, he said, while he was working there, he was given a, not a book, but a file to study, extensive file to study on the Philadelphia experiment. And the reason he was to study the Philadelphia experiment was to help with the stealth technology. Mm. Because, and even David Anderson in his later work has what was called Project Dark Star. Because mm -hmm. when you put something into time, it appears invisible. You don't see it anymore. Interesting. Because it's in a different, so that he called it Dark Star. Wow, but, interesting. But, but if you use, if you use um, the Philadelphia experiment technology, which was rotating magnetic fields, and you use David Anderson's technology, which uses low-grade electromagnetic fields, that there are two different technologies, but that's at least one similarity. Mm. Um, things will disappear at some point. Wow, when that's you, very you, interesting. Because so, you're going into a different dimension of being, a different. Well, you're, 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 sp time is just like space. Uh huh. It's space, but we're in a continuity of space. Right. And, and if you put it into three dimensions and then four dimensions, it's still there. You're right. Just in this dimension. You're just so, in this dimension. So, so basically, it's, it's, it disappears. And so, the stealth tech, I mean, the Philadelphia experiment was like Wild West technology. Wow. And, and, and the stealth technology, and to what degree it involves, I think it does involve manipulation of time. Preston always said that the absorbing, uh, absorbing paint was, a, was, they do use it, but it's, that's just a lower level of stealth. Hmm. Where, where radar won't pick it up. Wow. So you can have radar invisibility, or you can have actual invisibility, and, and, and there, there's a point where they meet up. And Interesting. The, the question becomes is, to what degree are stealth airplanes and stealth ships, do they actually disappear? To what level? Mm. Uh, this is something that I can't answer you, but the potential is there. And how refined is the technology? Preston worked on this. He studied this file on the Philadelphia experiment. Um, I also believe that he saw film on it because there used to be newsreels on it that they showed back in the day. I've talked to people, different people who've seen it. One person saw it when the Philadelphia experiment movie, the, the video or the, the cinema version was released in Philadelphia. She was in Philadelphia, this lady, and she saw it. Mm. The newsreel, which is, they showed the newsreel of wow. the original Philadelphia experiment. Wow. Um, 
this film, and, and it was probably filmed with much more than just newsreel, because this film was once delivered to Preston Nichols by somebody. And Al Bielek, uh, Preston's colleague, mentioned this and was very upset with Preston because Preston, uh, you know, turned it back over to the government. And the reason he did that is because he was obligated by uh, agreements he'd signed. So somebody had stolen it, gave it to Preston, who was, who was the wrong person to give it to. Wow. Because Preston was not going to do anything with it because... He already he, had signed all these agreements. Yeah, I mean, and he was afraid of it. So, so anyway, when he wrote the book, he said, there's a 30-year non-disclosure agreement on talking about the Philadelphia experiment, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, Preston, it's, it's now past 30 years. We can, mm -hmm. we can talk about it. He goes, it was 50. It was 50. Now, he, it, it wasn't 50. He just said that. Uh -huh. He said that because he didn't want to talk about it. Right. And he didn't want to talk about it for one of two reasons. One is because he was afraid mm -hmm. and program, or one is because he was holding on to the secret. He didn't want to share it. Right. It was an aspect of him as well. So Preston was a genius. Do you um, think the secret know? got revealed in your book? No, not particularly. I mean, just the fact that, I mean, he talks, he doesn't talk too much about the Philadelphia experiment. Mm -hmm. He gives a general outline of it, and he right. understood a lot about it. Right. But it doesn't even matter anymore. Mm -hmm. because we now have more advanced technology. Got it. Day. Got and it. So that was Wild West technology. Yeah. It's sort of like comparing a musket to a modern automatic weapon. Right. You know, uh, what do you need a musket for? We need right. to go back and look how the musket was made. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's some value in it. Have guys caught in the wall of the ship and all that. That was not pretty. No, no, exactly. And, and, <clears> and <throat> the, the technology from Dr. David Anderson is much more streamlined and effective, but it has its own problems. Mm -hmm. And you see this in the work of Raju Cinema in, in the current book. Um, they're, they're building a, a chair, right. which is some, in some respects similar to the Montauk chair, but it is, it is to facilitate basically going outside of the body and remote viewing, for lack of a better word. Interesting, yeah. And, and I wouldn't call it remote viewing in a typical sense, but what happens is they evolve the technology to the point where he ends up going to a secret base in America and seeing somebody who sees him back. Mm. In other words, the person, right. he's accidental. He's not going there to spy. Uh -huh. but he ends up in a situation where he looks like a spy on the etheric plane, and they go back and see him. So this creates a whole dynamic chain of events that I'm in the middle of translating right now. I haven't gotten to the conclusion. Interesting. But so, in other words, no matter where you are, whether you have a time machine, a remote viewing machine, uh, maybe you're just the new guy with all the insight on Wall Street. Uh-huh. And you show up on the radar. Right. The Wall Street trading radar. You become a force on Wall Street. Right. All of a sudden, all of your peers, contemporaries, or enemies, or potential enemies, see you, mm -hmm. and you are visible on the grid. Right. So this is what happens with anybody in any endeavor. Well, and what about remote? What about remote viewing just without a machine? You're, it's like the guy you're talking about on Wall Street, who's really tuned in, and he just happens to show up energetically, right? Well, that 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 could be the case too. Like mm -hmm. you know, what is who's what is this force manipulating the markets? I mean, we've all heard of George Soros and, and buying current and other people buying currencies, selling currencies, but what if there's a influence there? It's a mm -hmm. subtle influence. And there are other subtle influences on Wall Street that mm -hmm. generate fear, that generate greed, that generate, you know, it's like right. you're, you're powerful enough in thought you could just generate this stuff. But the, the point of it here, it's just like, um, you know, the, the great uh, samurai warrior who, uh, who could beat everybody. Mm -hmm. and he'll finally he beat every, and then, you know, he's going from one environment to the next, and finally he spends the rest of his life seeking peace because he didn't find anybody he couldn't beat. Right. And, 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 you know, but then what's the point of this? Right. Now he has to find peace. So 
you're always going to be challenged no matter who you are or what you're doing, if, at least if you're trying to accomplish something. So, so yeah, th this is, uh, you know, one's experience is you're trying to deal with, dealing with life is much more important than dealing with a specific theme of dealing with time, uh, dealing with uh, even becoming superhuman. You, you know, you have to first become a integrated human. And then, and then the superhuman part will take care of itself. That's right. Yeah. So, Peter, have you time traveled? Would you consider time traveling? How do you relate to that from a personal basis? Because you've done all this amazing research. And, and talking to you is kind of like the way you write. You have all these amazing trails that you unfold in your writing, which your writing is fascinating. Um, and... A lot of times we go in some big loops to get to where we're ending up, but you know. time is a big loop, and and it's yeah. like I, um, I didn't set out. I mean, the, the the time travel TV show was the favorite TV show of mine when I was a kid. I didn't watch it too often uh, because it was on Friday nights, which conflicted with the night I go to the movies. All, all the kids would go to the movies on Friday night, but I, I did watch it. You know. Uh, and it was also the favorite movie of Preston Nichols. And of course he did a lot more with it than I did with time. But the, the theme, uh, I encountered it when I moved to Long Island and it was wow. It was like, I'd studied a lot about the human spirit and life in general. And this was like, it's like the final frontier. As they say in Star Trek, space is the final frontier. Well, time is beyond space or is a part of space. Uh, that they will talk about sometimes they'll have time travel but right. it's it's a as they say it's it's the ultimate because it's what kills people it's a, a chronos uh the god chronos has been defined or or said many times as the only teacher that eats all its pupils eats its pupils you know all of it yeah you know, it eats all of its pupils it's the people that try to study it. so um the most spectacular experience I had personally was in a dream state when I, when I studied, uh, when I was writing the Montauk project. So I was being indulged. I was indulging in phenomena of time consciousness. Right. And I was uh, put on a, what I could describe as a electric burner on a stove. It wasn't, but it was looked like that in a closet. And it was a very beat up, sort of looked like a sound stage that hadn't been used for a long time, like a Hollywood sound stage with anyway, they put in this alcove or closet and Preston says, Don't worry, it's not gonna hurt you. He says, I'm good. And he went in the next one and he pushes this lever and then we come out and he says, We're now in 1943. Wow. And we walk out and there's all these army vehicles. Wow. 1943 army vehicles that looks like a the movie Invaders from Mars or, or one of these where the army comes out to, you know, surveil the, the UFOs. Mm -hmm. And like seeing all this. And then, then I see Duncan Cameron, the, the time traveler, psychic from the talk, and he's in a flatbed just sitting there. And he looks at me and he looks at me and he says, we need a piece of equipment fixed back there. Like I'm the mechanic who's supposed to fix it. Wow. I said, not a mechanic. I mean, why is he saying this to me? And it was like, well, because I'm going back to fix something. I'm going back to fix something that's wrong. And mm -hmm. this is what my work was. So I was there to do a repair. And, and wow. I, you could say that I've done a lot of repair on that project, um, not by going back into time, but by correlating and organizing information. Mm, I just cool. released a book in January called L. Ron Hubbard, The Dow of Insanity. Right. And I was told uh, by a, a clairvoyant friend of mine who, who works with me every month, she says, there's something about this guy. She doesn't read my books. She's not a reader. Right. She knows who I am. And she says, she says, you did a lot of, he's, you did a lot of good for him. He, what, what, well, I don't know why he's coming up, but he's got his, he's got his stuff together now. Uh, and, and, and I said, well, I wrote a book about it. You organized the I, I clarified uh, and pointed out a lot of things that went right and things that went wrong. 
and she said, it's not me saying this, that, you know, it, it kind of affected him on the other side to where. Nice. So I'd like to, um, I know that also referring to L. Ron Hubbard, that you worked with him kind of closely for a number of years. So you really did have kind of an inside scoop on that story. Also, very much. I have some very good news. Okay. Uh, right now, um, people are going through the, the COVID crisis, which has so much to do with the planets that are in force right now, mm. Jupiter and uh, conjunct with Pluto in right. Capricorn, which means tyranny and, and expanded tyranny. Mm. In and this is what people are experiencing. Yes. Whether it's right or wrong, yes. it's tyranny. Yes. And, and so this will go on throughout the election, not because it's an election, because that's when the planets begin to move apart. Right. And it might even last beyond that. It won't last more than a year, the, the absolute tyranny that we're, we're experiencing. But I look beyond. I look beyond to August 12, 2023, because that is the anniversary of the biorhythm, what's called the, the, bio, the natural biorhythm, mm. which was recognized long before the Philadelphia Experiment and Montauk projects. But every August 12th is the center date, but every between 10 and 14, August every year there is a biorhythm and this occurs when Sirius is most direct to the earth. Mm, I'm the getting Egyptians, chills again. The Egyptians aligned their pyramid with this. Right. Egyptians honored this time period as the high holy days of ancient Egypt. Nice. When the sun was closest to Sirius and the forgotten Genesis goes back into the you know Syrian DNA has been very, the Syrians have been very prevalent on earth. Yes. He's talking about it from a different reference point. So ever in August 12th, 1943 was the Philadelphia experiment. August 12th, 1963 was the ITT Brentwood project in Long Island. And that was a forerunner of what became the heart project. Wow. And that's an obscure project, but it did exist. Uh, 1983 was the Montauk project in August 12th. So wow. in 2013, 2003, we were excited, waiting, what's going to happen in 2003? Right. I was out at Montauk on August 12, 2003. Mm. And then uh, there was a blackout on the 14th, huge blackout, biggest wow. blackout we've ever had. And the center of it was Preston Nichols' new home in Cairo, New York. Wow. Uh, and it extended up into Canada. It extended, I think Montauk was- I'm getting total time. shows again. Yeah, but what was also going on in that day, which I didn't find out for years later, was the discovery in the Buchej Mountains of Romania of the, the chamber beneath the Sphinx. It was going on in that day. Wow. Not the discovery of it, but the uncovering of it when they right. actually opened it. So this was like, say, wow, this was something much bigger that would change my life in a big way. Yes. So I, so, you know, the 10-year biorhythms are strong, but the 20-year biorhythms are the strongest. Now, it was in 1999 on August 11th that I met Dr. David Anderson, and that was mm. a great cross in the skies. Everybody chills, was chills. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. And somebody says, yeah, it's going to change your life. I didn't know I was going to meet David Anderson. So, yeah, that was a big deal. But now we're coming to the 20-year in 2023, which is three years away. Cool. So I... I cast a horoscope and it has a formation that um, is called a kite. Yes. And it's called a kite because it looks like a kite when you connect all the planets. Yeah. And the kite is a trying, meaning a triangulation of yes. three planets, which would be Pluto, um, Uranus, and Mars, I believe it is. Pluto, no, Plutus, Uranus, and I, 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 I don't even... I That's forget. okay, there's a kite. Uh, oh, yes, but it's, it's a magnificent... Uh, a mag... Here it is. It's... Um, sure enough, it is, it is Mars, Pluto... Mars and Mercury with Pluto and Uranus. That's the trine. Wow, the that's kite. pretty powerful. Now, now going in a... Uh, at the top of the kite is Neptune. And Neptune is a, the highest octave of spirituality. Right. And it's being reinforced by Pluto 
and Uranus in a positive way. These are the outer planets. And this is, what this means is a uh, time of transcendence and spiritual, yes. uh, spiritual growing up. And, and this growing up idea is, Love it. is signified in a separate part of the chart where Jupiter is squaring uh, Venus and the sun in Leo. And Venus in, in Leo signifies children mm. and a love of children. But it's squaring Jupiter, which means it's an expansion of that, but it means it's time to grow up. People are going to have to grow up, and it might be a sudden, a sudden shock to the system. Uh, kind of being thrown into the water and mm -hmm. learning how to swim. So what I'm saying is whatever's going on with the coronavirus is I can look ahead and people can look ahead to a time of uh, when all of the themes that I have been involved with, it shows to a very positive uh, evolution. Like I, so this also coincides with perhaps the release of, of a movie on these themes. Nice. And new technology mm -hmm. that is being released from the secret sector. Yes. To make a-, a Total chills. It's, it, this, this is, right now things are being, uh, lined up for mm -hmm. the material that I published to be featured in a, in a format that we do not have right now, mm -hmm. technologically. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be, it might be one of the first releases of, mm -hmm. of technology that will, will be better <clears throat> if you're watching football better than sitting on the 50 yard line. You, you feel like you were there watching the players run right in front of you or, or like going into the Montauk underground and looking around and seeing the whole scape. Right. And that technology is coming. I, I know about it. Actually here it's, it has to be refined. Right. You know, it's friendly. You can do it. You can pop in and this way other people can use it mm -hmm. people can use it and have an interface mm -hmm. and, nice. and you would see like you've never seen before. Cool. And with the lighting, and with the like the, the subtleties of the shading. Mm -hmm. So like if a plane flew over, you see the you'd feel the you know, you wouldn't have touch and taste. But you'd have the sound, you'd hit maybe the vibration. But they're working on the taste and the feel. Interesting. So the technology. Interesting. So, um, this is a whole evolution. And uh, it's my personal belief that that this has been released from the technology in Romania, but I, I can't say that it has because cool. uh, I don't, I can't prove that. It's just yes. what I've heard. Uh, there's been subtleties said to me, but we'll see. So How anyway, exciting. there's a lot of exciting things for the future. Uh, and, and for people who are depressed right now, look to 2023. It's only three years away. People yes. complain how time fast, how fast time goes. Yes. Well, uh, th yeah. This will be over. This will be over in a year's time. Yay! Cool. I love that. I love hearing that. And um, I have heard that twenty three is kind of a mega leap. That that is like a major shifting point into the next phase of maybe our evolutionary leap. This pressure of this downward pressure is helping people wake up, and then at moving the end into of twenty three. At the end of twenty three, Pluto will exit Capricorn and go into Aquarius, cool. which means uh, technology. And, and, and as one astrologer said, Star Trek type technology coming cool. fully online. We've already have the cell phone, cool. which is Star Trek uh, type technology. Yes. But uh, we might find, uh, you know, maybe we'll have, a, I hate to say this, stun guns. <laughs> you know, like they have, they stun the people on <clears throat> Star Trek. Right. But, um, yeah. Inviting people just to read your books, um, skybooksusa.com. And, and then the time travel education center.com. Is that correct? That's a good way you can learn the easy math and physics of how time travel can be accomplished theoretically. Uh, it's very simple. It's, it, it's, it's within the bounds of ordinary science. And Beautiful. this is something that, that was not, still not very well understood, uh -huh. uh, but it's, it's much easier to understand than it ever, ever was. Nice. So we'll put those links under this video. And um, anything else you'd like to inspire, encourage, invite people to be aware of in this moment in time? I'm working on uh, which might be some of the most earth shattering or 
dynamic change uh, that, that um, I'm, I'm writing a book right now called The Roswell Deception and wow. World War II Mysteries and how World War II has been a complete, the story of what happened in World War II, including the Roswell incident, has been a complete snow job. Wow. And it, and it all has to do with, uh, what is it, uh, biological warfare. Wow. And World War I, the, the, the American Army flu, which is, I mean, all of this stuff is like, I mean, this was both sides using biocidal warfare and, uh, and all of the gold that was given to MacArthur. Mm. Japan had billions of dollars of gold when they raided, you know, the uh, Southeast Asia. They had all this gold, they hid it in the Philippines. And MacArthur was completely bought off. This is why they didn't kill the emperor. They couldn't kill the emperor. They wow. couldn't kill him anyway. But he basically bought off MacArthur and 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 the Allies. And 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 there's like uh, so much of World War II hasn't been told, and, and you've been told a sack of lies by the Office of War Information. And uh, they capitulated to Emperor Hirohito in many wow. ways. They, they didn't have to admit it publicly but they did. And this is a book I'm doing with Douglas Dietrich. Uh, and this is just a warm up book because this book is, 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 is astounding. And it is, and how, how the Roswell incident was not what, what the army, the army tried to make you think it was flying saucers, uh -huh. aliens. And it was not, uh, but that's because they had war crimes, serious war crimes they were hiding, uh, which was POWs, uh -huh. uh, Japanese POWs that weren't released in 1947. And they were, you know, they portrayed them as aliens. They were, wow. Well, they I hope you'll reveal what Area 51 is in your book. <laughs> um, well, that, that, you know, what it was, what it became, I can't tell you, but right. what, it was, what it was. And I will be putting this soon on the website, you know, the, the initial rushes of the book, and you can read that. I've got oh. six chapters. I haven't put it on the website. I'm having it proofread right now. Um, but yeah, is so, that, so, that Skybooks yeah. or time travel? Um, that, that'll be, I, I post what I'm writing for those people who are subscri paid subscribers to the Time Travel Education Center. Right. And I, I put that on there so you can read that. And it'll, it'll just be probably just a few days before I put it on. I, I forgot cool. to put it on. And, uh, and so that's, that's really exciting and interesting. And uh, that, that's going to, but, but what comes after it is, e is equally because it goes right into the, you know, the busting of the, the beast, so to speak. To, to How exciting, <laughs> exciting, exciting. Awesome, Peter. And yeah. um, just about Montauk, I know uh, I have a friend who actually kind of grew up there and um, she's told me that there's amazing energy there. I mean, do you think that amazing energy is part of the earth or do you think those time travel experiments that were done there had something to do with enhancing that earth energy? No, the, that was there indigenously. Okay. And, and it's, you can even see if you were to put Montauk on a globe and how it relates to Egypt and the icosahedron, there's a, you know, why, why was the Great Pyramid put in, in Giza, you know, and the way that the energy of the earth changes. There's a lot of energy at Montauk. And, and that's why they picked it. Interesting. Uh, it, it was sought after. And, and the, the pharaohs, the Montauk pharaohs were the, the keepers of this grid. They were called wow. pharaohs just like in Egypt. So yeah, that, that energy was there. The problem with the energy at Montauk was that they messed with it. Uh -huh. They messed with it and they tried to harness it. Mm -hmm. And this is, this, is, this is the problem. The sacrilege so, of... Just like the Catholic uh -huh. Church uh, sequestering Christianity and turning it into something other than what it was. Right. Should be or could be. Right. And one more thing. Um, I know my husband and I are both really excited to one of these days travel with you to Romania. So when, when the world opens up a little bit, if you do more trips to Romania, um, we get to go see some of those really interesting places that you've written about. I'd love to go be on that land. It seems like it has amazing energy. I was going to go this year. I still might, but uh, there's so many travel restrictions. Yeah. And I think everybody still might be recovering. I had right. a great trip planned to the cave, okay. yeah. um, but okay, it's it's uh, it's certainly in the to be continued. Yeah, it's certainly been exciting.
Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for spending this time with me. And um, I just want to remind everybody to breathe, smile, and love. And we shall see you on this great journey and adventure that we're all on. Any last words of wisdom, Peter? No, thank you. It was nice to be with you again. Awesome. All right. We'll see you soon. Empower your life as a 21st century superhuman with host Carrie Kiristar Ellis and guests. Navigate these times of great change with Carrie's 21st Century Superhuman book series, being called the most important books on the planet and guidebooks for our times. You are a creator. Remember to breathe, smile, and love. For as we change ourselves, we change the world. Learn more at 21stCenturySuperhuman.com. Oh.